As many of you know, tonight's program was made possible by the generous support of the New Jersey Legislature for the Senator Winona Lippman Chair in Women's Political Leadership. The chair honors the first African-American woman in the state Senate representing Essex County for 27 years in the New Jersey Legislature. And I think it's really important to remember that over those years, she became the strongest and most consistent voice in the legislature for women and minorities. She was the legislature's leading advocate on behalf of children, families, low-income people, small businesses, and people with AIDS. She tackled issues including employment discrimination, marriage law, child support, sexual assault, domestic violence, and the rights of children. Senator Lippman also taught at Essex County College and was a great supporter of New Jersey's community colleges. For many, many of her years in the Senate, she was the only woman there, always speaking up for those with the least access to the political process, always alert to the political implications of race and gender. And if you'd like to know more about this fantastic woman, you can read a full bio of her that's on our website. And through the legislature's continuing support for the Lippman Chair, we have been able to bring an extraordinary roster of distinguished women to Rutgers to inspire us, and tonight is no exception. And we are so honored that the legislature has entrusted us to keep Senator Lippman's legacy alive. And we do that through this lecture series, but also by supporting Essex County residents to attend COP's Ready to Run program and for community college students to participate in new leadership. Both programs are very much in keeping with Senator Lippman's interest in empowering women to lead. Now, everybody here tonight is a very important person, but I do want to acknowledge Assemblywoman Shavonda Sumter, who is here. And I'd like to ask her to take our thanks back to her colleagues in Trenton and give, and give them our regards and thank them for their continuing support of the chair. I also want to acknowledge Newark City Council President Mildred Crump. And we are really thrilled tonight to have a member of Senator Lippman's family with us this evening, her cousin, Sharon Edmondson. I want to thank all three of you for joining us. We also are very lucky to have a distinguished advisory committee that aids us in implementing the Lippman Chair, and I'd like to thank two of the members of that group who are here tonight. Alma Saravia, who worked with Winona Lippman for many years as executive director of the Commission on Sex Discrimination in the Statutes. Alma. And Senator Nia Gill, who I'm going to say a little bit more about in just one minute. I also want to thank Joanne Rajapi, who is the county clerk in Union County. These are our elected women officials. We are so proud of them, Joanne. Are there any other elected women here? All right, I got them, that's good. Um, it's always tricky when you start to do that, right? So I'm gonna do a little special introduction of Senator Gill because she is a longtime friend of COP and I've asked her to introduce our speaker this evening. I don't get that privilege. I get to close the program, she gets to open it. Nia Gill is a practicing attorney as well as a lawmaker. Early in her career, Senator Gill worked for Winona Lippman as her legislative aide. Later, she followed in, senators, in the Senator's footsteps, and she herself has served in the State Senate since 2002, representing the 34th District. She's currently Senate President Pro Tem, Vice Chair of the Judiciary Committee, and a member of the Transportation Committee and the Legislative Services Commission. She served in the Assembly from 1994 to 2001. Throughout her service in Trenton, she has forcefully championed many of the same issues as Senator Lippman did. Indeed, many of the same issues that our speaker tonight covers as a journalist. So it is a great pleasure and an honor for me to introduce our introducer, Senator Nia Gill. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, this is really a privilege, so I'd like to say thank you, Debbie. In 1971, Winona Lippman became the first African-American woman elected to serve in the New Jersey State Senate. Before that, uh, Senator Littman lived in Montclair. I live in Montclair. I was the babysitter for Will and Karen. So we got <laughs> uh, During her almost 30 years of service, she fundamentally transformed the use of power to address the issues of women and children and give voice to the voiceless. As an educator, a mother, a professor, Martin Luther King's French tutor, a public servant, and an activist, Senator Littman fought the fight. She stood when no one else would stand, and she stared down injustice and was victorious. Her legacy resounds throughout the state and in the halls of our state capitol. Every time we fight for equality, access, and opportunity, and every time we raise our voices to resist an oppressive president or governor, Winona is with us. She taught an entire generation of legislators and leaders that we can and we must be an instrument of individual and collective transformation. If you really want to stand out from the crowd and be recognized by society, Senator Littman said, then it is the quality of the contributions that you make to others that counts. Ms. Reed is here tonight because she continues Senator Winona Littman's legacy. She stands out from the cloud. She speaks truth to power. And she is an important voice on the issues that affect our nation as we strive to become a more perfect union. Joy Reed, a daughter of immigrants born in Brooklyn and raised in Denver, Colorado, is an award-winning journalist, national correspondent, and host of AM Joy on MSNBC. <laughs> she is the author of Fractured, Barack Obama, the Clintons, and, race, and the Racial Divide, and was managing editor of the Griot.com, a daily online news and opinion platform delivering stories and perspectives that reflect and affect African American audiences. Prior to working at the GRIO, she was a freelance columnist for the Miami Herald and editor of the political blog, The Reed Report. Currently, she is producing a documentary, The Fight Years. Well, that could be a New Jersey Senate, but I, maybe I help her co-author that one, uh, which takes a look at the sport of boxing during the 1950s and 1960s in Miami. Ms. Reed graduated from Harvard University and lives in Brooklyn with her husband and three children. Needless to say, Ms. Reed is an extremely accomplished journalist, and every day she lives her life as part of the ever evolving struggle for women, for women of color and for people who seek the truth. Today, Joy joins the company of accomplished, powerful warrior women, including Shirley Chisholm, to serve as Senator Littman's chair on women's public leadership. It is my joy <laughs> <laughs> to introduce to you Joy Ann Reed. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you so much, Senator Gill. Um, that was a very kind introduction, um, more kind than I deserve. Thank you very much. And to Debbie uh, for chaperoning me around uh, and taking such good care of me today. I want to, of course, thank the Center uh, for American Women in Politics here uh, at Rutgers for the invitation. I was trying to remember how I wound up getting here, and then I ran into Tara Dowdell, my friend who um, is one of the people who recommended me to do this talk. And, uh, and then I ran into Brittany Cooper. I'm like running into all of my, my cast members uh, over at MSNBC here. So it's really great to see them as well. Um, so thank you to all of you, all to the d distinguished elected officials who were here. Um, I got a chance to take a selfie with Akosia Busia, which I was really excited about because I love the color purple so much. And her, and her lovely sister, they took a selfie with me, so I was very grateful. <laughs> I just go around as a fan trying to meet people that I like. And I take speaking engagements in the hopes that somebody will be there that I can take a selfie with. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, this is a, a pretty momentous occasion. I was commiserating with Debbie on the way over that it's impossible to prepare for these kinds of events in the current uh, world because, you know, I try to write down some current events and then the man just tweets some more things. And then I'm like, I wasn't, I wasn't prepared to talk about all of that. Uh, one of the reasons that I love doing things like this is uh, one of the projects that I'm working on, a new book project, is um, about women, unsung women heroes of the movement. Um, it's the book I'm about to start. And in getting this invitation with the name Winona Lippman on it, it gave me the opportunity uh, to, do, to do my nerd thing, which is to look up information and, uh, and to do some research. And, and what an extraordinary woman uh, Winona Lippman was. I got a chance to meet her cousin, who is where? Where is she? Right there. Um, and um, as the speakers before me have said, she really was uh, phenomenal, the first African-American woman elected to the New Jersey State Senate, of course, a trailblazer and a pioneer, not only for her district, the 29th, but also for women, for me. Um, I'm going to go back a little bit further because I'm sort of always fascinated with the juxtapositions of things in history. So she was born in 1923, um, six years before MLK. Her parents, uh, she was born in LaGrange, Georgia. And a lot of you probably already know this. You guys could probably tell me this history. So I'm sort of telling myself all this stuff because I, I'm fascinated by it. Uh, her dad was a pharmacist. He owned a pharmacy and helped en make ends meet working as a bricklayer. And her mom was a teacher who taught her children at home. Can, I don't have to hold it. Thank God. <laughs> I was going to get carpal tunnel up here. That's not good. I thought I had to keep holding it. See, I'm bad at technology. I'm telling you, ask my kids. I can barely use my phone. You know, I tweet all the time. That's the only thing I know how to do. Um, she attended Talladega College and, of course, was a French major, which is why, uh, after getting her master's degree in French and teaching at Morehouse, um, she was able to tutor a young Dr. King. Um, and if you think about the things that uh, Winona Lippman was doing in the 50s, right? You think about the, the era, the 1950s. She's getting a Rockefeller grant to get her PhD at Columbia. Um, she's getting a Fulbright scholarship to go study at the Sorbonne. And this is in 1950 that she's doing this. So she's doing this four years before Brown versus Board. She's doing it five years before the Montgomery bus boycott. So you think about the status of women in this society at that time and the things that she was able to do. It's pretty phenomenal. She was doing them not in the 60s, not in the 70s, but in the 50s. Um, she, of course, met her husband, Walter, in Paris, uh, and he was, of course, a philosophy major, super smart people. Um, but then they couldn't move back to the United States and move back to Georgia because Georgia was one of 16 states that had um, anti-miscegenation laws, and we still were 16 years ahead of Loving versus Virginia. Think about that. She was a Sorbonne graduate and a Rockefeller Grant scholar, but she couldn't live in Georgia with her own husband and, and children because it was illegal. So they, of course, did what any self-respecting uh, bright couple on the, on the move would do. They moved to New Jersey. <laughs> right thing to do. Uh, and of course, she got involved in politics the way that my favorite way of people getting involved in politics through the PTA. It's important. A lot of people undersell the importance of getting involved at that local level, right? That's where it starts. Those local offices, hey, Republicans know that, by the way, if you're a Democrat in this room. Republicans go into school board elections. That's why they, right? They create feeder systems. And of course, as mentioned before, she got elected in 1971. And think about that. That was a year before 
one of my personal heroes and your very first Lippmann le lecturer, Shirley Chisholm, uh, became the first black woman to run for president of the United States. So a year before that, she's already uh, winning election. She beats a Republican by 908 votes out of 170,000 votes, 908 votes. But after that, she never loses with less than 83% of the vote. So once she got the seat, she had the seat. I, I'm gonna hold that baby. I, I have, my kids are, are, 90, are 21, 19, and 17, so I miss having a baby so badly. I'm so tempted to run off the stage and go and hold that baby, you have no idea. And uh, while Ms. Lippman did not live to see the election of the first black president, um, she was such a champion of important issues that are of issue today, the protection of children from exploitation and abuse, the prevention of domestic violence, the fight against HIV AIDS, which is jeopardized, by the way, by this new budget uh, that's been proposed, the rights of women, the opportunities for minorities, small businesses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, she was a, a dynamic and important person, so it's a real honor to speak um, on a day that honors her. Uh, and just to show you guys, I, I do do my research. Her nickname, does anybody know what her nickname was? The Steel Magnolia. <laughs> I think that's pretty fly. That's a very Southern thing. So, so I say all that to say that, you know, the, the past is, is to me never past. The things that we've gone through are so cyclical in our history that you look at the fights that were taking place in the 1950s and really going back to the 1920s are happening today. So I will start uh, my formal talk by saying a happy equal pay day to everyone. Uh, it's not so happy, necessarily, <laughs> for women. 70% uh, of women around the world, there was actually a poll uh, that Gallup did, and 70% of the women all around the world would prefer to work for pay, would prefer to have a paid job um, than to stay at home, according to the most recent figures. Uh, as of the most recent figures that are available, uh, that Pew Research does this study, and they pretty much do it every couple of years, 2015, white women, regardless of education, still only earn 82 cents for every dollar earned by a man. That's an improvement. It's up from 60 cents in 1980. But for women of color, it's much worse than that. Women of color, uh, for black women, it drops down to 65 cents for every dollar earned by a man almost what white women were earning in, this, in 1980. But that's actually still an improvement up from 56 cents on the dollar in 1980. It gets even worse when you talk about Latina women. Latina women only earn 58 cents for every dollar, regardless of education, this is controlling for whether you have a college degree, it doesn't matter. And that's up from only 53 cents. The group with the closest parity to white men are Asian American women who are actually doing pretty well, but they're still not earning one to one. They're at 87 cents on the dollar. On the average, average hourly wages for those who work hourly for black and Hispanic men were $15 and, dollar, $15 and $14 respectively, compared to $21 for white men. And the Asian men are the only group that outpace uh, white men in terms of hourly earnings at $24. But when you look at women across all races and ethnicities, we are behind, we are lagging behind. Uh, Asian and white women earn 18 and $17 average per hour respectively, um, which is more than black and Hispanic men, but less than white men. Um, and Hispanic women and black women are only earning 12 and $13 an hour respectively. Again, higher than black and Hispanic men, but lagging significantly behind white men. So Donald Trump commemorated Equal Pay Day today. <laughs> Why is everybody laughing about that? There's some things that aren't meant to be funny, but you say it and it's immediately... He, he did, he commemorated it today, and here's what he did. He signed an executive order which rolled back the Fair Pay and Safe Workplaces Act of 2014. Happy Equal Pay Day. And that was an act that forced government contractors, people who accept government contract money, to comply with a series of 14 laws protecting workers. And that includes paycheck transparency, and which basically means that your, your employer can't hide how much the disparity is between yourself and another worker or fire you for asking about it. That was what the Lilly Ledbetter Act was about. One of the other rules that it was forcing these contractors to abide by was something called not having forced arbitration, which means that if you have a dispute with your employer, you're forced to go into secret arbitration and putting that in your contract. Uh, he d did away with a rule that got rid of what's called cover-up clauses, 
which mean that if you are sexually harassed at work, your employer can make sure that information never becomes public. He got rid of that protection. And it's interesting because the arbitration clause and the cover-up clause actually were very relevant to the news this week as I'm updating and updating and updating this talk because things keep happening. Uh, as of now, I think 13 advertisers has pu have pulled out of the O'Reilly factor. It might be more. It was, it was one when I woke up this morning. It was nine by the time I left the talk that I did in DC. And it was 13 by the time I got off the Amtrak here. So it's happening at a pace, at a clip. But what's interestingly, uh, interesting enough is that Gretchen Carlson, who's the woman who started the ball rolling by suing Fox News for years, what she said were years and years of sexual harassment, um, the forced arbitration and cover-up clauses made it impossible for her to sue Fox News. She actually couldn't sue them because she had an arbitration clause in her contract. So the very thing that the Obama era regulation was meant to fix, she fell into that trap. And it was only because she had the financial wherewithal to individually sue Roger Ailes that she was able to get justice. But not every woman has the money to sue a powerful individual man like Roger Ailes. She just happened to have that kind of funds to hire an attorney and sue herself. If not, she would have fallen into the forced arbitration black hole and would not have even been able to talk about the details of her case because it would have been against Fox News. And in her contract, she wasn't allowed to do that. So, and it's interesting, on this paper here, it still says nine advertisers have dropped, but it's like, it's 13 at this point. And it's, um, it's only one of the many lawsuits that are happening against Fox. We're not hearing a lot about it, but there are also three black employees who are suing Fox News for racial discrimination. So Trump's executive order also frees companies from rules requiring them to submit even information about employee salaries and compensation to the government. So we may not even have the data on pay disparities anymore by the time his four years are up. And we know this is also happening in all of the sciences areas, in the EPA, et cetera. The data is just disappearing. But the data that's also disappearing is the kind of data we need on equal or unequal pay. But the good news, Ivanka did tweet about equal pay day today. So she's got your back. She tweeted. She also said she doesn't know what it means to be complicit in an interesting interview with Gail King, but I don't want to go off track. Remember, okay. I don't want to go off into a whole Saturday Night Live thing. You just have to watch it on Google. Uh, the president's proposed budget, um, since we're talking about what we know, right? That's the topic here, what we know. We know the president's proposed budget would strip all funding from Planned Parenthood, uh, Meals on Wheels, Corporation for Public Block, uh, Broadcasting, and uh, our elected officials uh, in the audience will understand this one, Minority Development Block Grants, zeroed out. So, this is the point at which I have to tell you that it is also National Hug a News Person Day. <laughs> <laughs> so even if I tell you bad news, at the end you have to hug me. That's true. So what else do we know? We know that we are only 74 days into the Donald Trump presidency. That's 74 days. That is 10.57 weeks, 1,776 hours. That is 106,560 minutes, or 6,393,600 seconds, which is more how it feels to so many people. Apologies to any Trump voters in the room, I apologize. <laughs> it's just been long as somebody who's working in the business. 74 days, we're not even through the first 100 days. We know that Donald Trump was elected with the 46th largest electoral college margin out of, a, out of 58 contests that have been held since 1782. Um, he's very proud of it though, um, for context. <laughs> Uh, Trump won. He's still tweeting about it. That's why I'm talking about it, because he's still tweeting about his electoral margins. Trump got 56.9% of the electoral college in January. The historical average per 538 is 70.9%. So just to give you some context, Ronald Reagan got 90.9%. Ulysses S. Grant, a very underrated president in my view, got 81.95%. George Washington, 100%. <laughs> so Trump got 56.9%. Abraham Lincoln, one of the most contentious elections in our history, got 90.99%. FDR, 98.5%. Barack Obama, in one of the most sort of racially, obviously the most racially contentious president uh, ever elected, his first election, he got 67.8%. Trump got 569 So there you go. And he, he lost by 3 million votes, but who's counting? 
Hillary Clinton, by the way, um, has the highest vote, sec I think she has the second highest vote total of anyone ever not elected, or ever elected, or won who won the popular vote. So we know that despite um, those, his claims to the contrary, Trump's inaugural was not the most watched in history. Um, he just donated the first three months of his presidential salary to the Park Service, uh, perhaps to incentivize him to revise those photos showing gaps in his inaugural crowd. Um, <laughs> Just jokes, folks, just jokes. Uh, or perhaps to make up for the draconian cuts to their budget, which he has proposed. Uh, we also know that we've never faced a presidency quite like this. Um, I've been following politics since I was a nerdy, you know, 11 or 12 year old. I was always fascinated by politics, um, but I've never seen anything like this. Um, I don't think anyone has ever seen anything like this. Uh, not just the massive conflicts of interest between himself, his children, and their business interests in the administration. Uh, his daughter is now an official federal employee, as is his son-in-law, but neither of them have the salary that actually tethers federal employees to the rights and responsibilities of full employees. Uh, his son, Jared, um, whose dad, the governor of this fair state, once sent to prison for tax evasion and witness tampering uh, when he was a federal prosecutor, before his own team members went to prison for Bridgegate is now in charge of everything. He's in charge of our policy, uh, our trade relations with our trade relations overall. He's, po he's in charge of our China policy, our Mexico policy, peace in the Middle East, um, and uh, making innovative changes to business at 36 years old, uh, with not having been elected and with zero foreign policy experience. Um, but he does have a lot of real estate experience, particularly dealing with countries like China. So that should work out very well. Uh, the Trump administration is currently doing business with itself by leasing the old post office in D.C., um, which used to be half empty before the election, but is now quite full of foreign dignitaries who would very much like to swipe their cards at the president's uh, hotel um, and patronizing his property, such as Mar-a-Lago, which costs $200,000 to join, which you know, where he lives every weekend and plays golf. And we learned this week that the trust that the president set up, uh, which is administered by his sons, actually allows him to take money out at will. Just today, the administration announced new measures for extreme vetting. And these new extreme vetting measures will include demanding that travelers to the US, including from countries like Germany and France, hand over their cell phones, tell their passwords, and answer intrusive questions about their personal opinions and beliefs, allowing the agent to scroll through their contacts. I was at a, a school this morning in Washington, D.C., at a high school, a private high school, and, and did a talk, and I, the kids were just aghast when I explained to them that if the reciprocal takes place, then you, as an American traveler, when you touch down at Heathrow, may be asked, give me your phone, put in your password, or tell me your password, and let me know who, who are these contacts in your phone. Who's this? Who's that? Who's that? And how this customs person would know the difference between a good guy and a bad guy on your phone, I have no idea. Maybe they'll just look and see if they're all Arabic names. But you could be denied entry if this rule goes into place. Um, this is the most extreme we've seen since the 1920s in terms of immigration uh, rejectionism. But that is something that we happened, that happened just today. We also know that his tre previous travel ban um, ensnared even green card holders which allowed them to be interrogated and in some cases detained. And as somebody who's married to a green card holder, that's disturbing. And that's something that we could see coming back. We know that the president is, as of right now, facing dozens of lawsuits, more than 50 in total right now, even after settling the Trump University fraud case for $25 million, including a newly filed defamation suit by a former contestant on The Apprentice, who Trump called a liar, Summer Zervos, uh, for her claims that he sexually harassed her. His current claim is that he cannot be sued by Ms. Zervos because he is a president and he is too busy. <laughs> Presidenting to take this lawsuit. Now, as of course we know, and uh, the, the recent election was very bound up in the old Clinton wars, and one of the outcomes of the Clinton wars was that Paula Jones made the argument that she could sue a sitting president. He made the argument that he was too busy. And the Supreme Court said, no, you're not. And so the Paula Jones precedent means uh, Summer can sue. So we may soon see a, a case. It's a defamation, not a sexual harassment case. But the interesting thing about that uh, is that there's a thing called discovery for our lawyers in the room. We have, a, we have actually a lot of august attorneys in the room. Discovery might mean we might get to see those 
apprentice tapes. So as a journalist, I'm like, bring it on. <laughs> Most of the lawsuits pertain to the travel ban by people who feel they were unlawfully detained. Uh, he's not suing yet, but we know the son of Muhammad Ali, whose name is Muhammad Ali Jr. <laughs> That's true. Was detained twice. His name is Muhammad Ali Jr. There's also a major civil rights lawsuit that claims that Donald Trump incited violence against protesters, including an African-American woman during his campaign um, when he said, get him out. And people got him out violently. And some of these protesters are now, protesters are now suing. There's a lawsuit that's claiming he's in violation of the Emoluments Clause of the Constitution for his business conflicts. There's also a lawsuit over the administration's threat to withhold funds from sanctuary cities. Uh, interestingly enough, sanctuary cities are mostly in blue states, which are donor states, which give more money to the federal government than they get back. And so trying to withhold money from them is thought by many to be unconstitutional. We know that ICE immigration raids have accelerated and that millions of men, women, and children are living in fear of themselves or a family member being deported if they keep their appointments, their regularly scheduled appointments with immigration officials, or if they drop their children off at school. And we know that those who are facing ICE immigration raids include dreamers. Uh, it includes not just Latinos, it includes people like my folks, uh, Caribbean people, African people. We recently had uh, a member of the legislature in Ireland come and see about his people, about 50,000 undocumented Irish are in the country as well. We also know that we face the unprecedented situation of a president who's currently under, whose administration is currently under FBI investigation for his campaign's alleged potential collusion with an adversarial foreign power, Russia to tilt the election in his favor. And we face a real crisis of confidence in the Congress of the United States, which is held by the president's party, to investigate this historically damning allegation. So just in the last 24 hours, just to get you guys updated on the news, we learned that Carter Page, <laughs> the president's advisor, shared US energy documents with a known Russian spy recruiter. <clears throat> we know that Eric Prince, the founder of Blackwater, the Remember the, the, the Iraq war group whose mercenaries were torturing Iraqis and they disbanded and changed the name to C, X-E. You know his sister is Betsy DeVos, right? Okay, you guys, you guys are very much in the know. Uh, we, we discovered this week that he, Eric Prince, sought to open a back channel between the administration and Vladimir Putin. And meanwhile, the administration has decided to redirect all of this controversy onto a woman, Susan Rice. And this is something I was just thinking about on the way over here. Susan Rice and Michael Flynn had the same job, right? I love these juxtapositions. You think about it, they had the exact same function. So Michael Flynn, the incoming national security advisor, is alleged to be talking to Russia, maybe colluding with Russia. We know that he was getting paid by Russian state TV and by Turkey. And so if that was being investigated, the person whose job it would be to protect the administration from an incoming potential colluder with a foreign power, to investigate the potential for this collusion, and to protect and defend the United States against this adversarial power, would be the national security advisor, the job that Michael Flynn was going for. So if Susan Rice received unmasked communications between a potential you know, Russian spy and an American, that's because she was doing her job. That's her job. That's who, that's who does that. That's the job that Michael Flynn was asking for. But we face this situation where when tough times come around, there's always a woman, a particular woman of color around, to throw under the bus, to blame, to make her the scapegoat. She's now the star of the show. Susan Rice, who isn't even in government anymore is now supposedly to blame because, of course, she's tied to Barack Obama. Um, well, it's not even here, but while I'm, where we're coming over, the administration made a comment about the uh, shelling with chemical weapons of children and women in Syria, and of course, they blamed Barack Obama. We also face the possibility that Neil Gorsuch will become the first Supreme Court nominee since Abe Fortas to be successfully filibustered. Uh, and of course, LBJ had to withdraw Fortas' nomination for Chief Justice in 68 to fill Earl Warren's seat. It could happen again. Uh, we now know that the nuclear option is on the table and that we could see soon have the end of the 60 vote threshold to place justices on the court, which has incredible implications, particularly for women particularly since one of the main reasons that 
the Heritage Foundation and others want a conservative court is women, is women and their reproductive rights, women and their options, <clears throat> women and their options to terminate a pregnancy in particular. Today, Donald Trump signed a sweeping executive order, <clears throat> excuse me, rolling back a slew of Obama era environmental regulations, regulations aimed at giving uh, the, what he signed, the executive order will give oil and gas and coal companies more latitude to drill, to frack, and to dump the resulting waste into our rivers and streams. The ostensive reason for this, of course, is to bring down energy prices and to bring back blue collar jobs by, for instance, keeping open coal mines that would normally be shuttered because of safety concerns or emissions problems. This morning, the president also signed a bill that will allow your internet service provider to sell your browser history without getting your permission. So delete your browser history every day. We also know that countering all this is a growing and active resistance movement. Now we get to the good news. I was gonna eventually get to the good news. That has produced the largest marches since the 1963 March on Washington. 63 March on Washington, 250,000 people. Vietnam War protests considerably larger. Global protests against the war in Iraq, millions of people. 4.2 million people marched in the international women's marches the day after the election. More than 600 cities around the world. And New Jersey wasn't left out. 6,000 people in Little Asbury Park, 1,000 in Newark, 6,000 in Trenton. Even Little Mount Laurel had 20 people marching. They had 20 people out there going, no justice, no peace. 20 people. And what's really sort of fascinating about what's happened, particularly given the results of the last election, is that this is a resistance that is being led primarily by women. And not really by young women. Women made up 86% of the phone callers to Congress that brought down the first attempt to repeal Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, 86%. And it was a bill that collapsed after just 18 days. And you think about the fact that Obamacare itself took 187 days to enact. They spent 18 days trying to repeal it because they wanted to get to the date certain of repealing it on the day it was signed, 18 days but it was brought down by millions and millions of Americans who actually stood up and owned their civic duty, most of whom were women. There is a, an organization called, there's an organization that, ha, there's a tool called Daily Action, which is what a lot of people were using to organize themselves to do this, and a company called Lake Research Polling did a survey of the people who use this Daily Action uh, tool, and that's how they came up with this 86% figure, but they came up with something else that is fascinating about the resistance. They found that 66% of those who participated in these resistance phone calling campaigns and show up campaigns and town hall campaigns were over the age of 45. And we all know, of course, that the resistance leader is my auntie Maxine Waters, <laughs> who is, I won't say her age because I don't say women's ages. But women of a certain generation are standing up. These are the same women who went very heavily for Hillary Clinton, um, who are probably in the most shock that she didn't become president. And they are now taking up the mantle and leading the resistance. And they are leading the young people. And by the way, um, they're not going to be, they're not gonna be able to take too much time off. We learned today that the administration and its allies in Congress met again to plot a second act of trying to repeal Obamacare. They're still coming after it. They still want to get rid of the essential services portion of Obamacare, meaning addiction counseling, maternity care, other basics. They want to get rid of that. Um, they want to get rid of the Medicaid expansion, which 19 Republican-led states have refused to take, which accounts for about 5 million people, about 1.1 million of them are in my former state of Florida. In New Jersey, 285,000 people have access to Medicaid because of the expansion. I suspect if Winona were here, she would fight tooth and nail to keep it. So knowing all of these things uh, are happening and knowing that there's so much going on out there and it's so difficult to keep up with, the question is what do we do with it? Because we do know that we have an administration that has made a commitment to accelerating something that was already a negative trend. And it was a negative trend toward people not believing facts, toward people not believing information given to them even if the information is obvious. I made the analogy earlier this morning that if I tell you 2.2 2 plus 2 is 4 and you tell me it's 5, we cannot have an argument. We cannot have a debate because 2 plus 2 just isn't 5. And there's no way that I can have a coherent debate with you about something that is just factually not true. 
But that is what we find ourselves doing in my business. The whole idea of fake news is news I don't like, is information that makes me unhappy. And we've had a 40-year campaign, and I will blame, even though I used to be in talk radio, talk radio, for encouraging a culture of saying, the only thing I have to believe is what I feel in my gut. If I feel in my gut that it is right, then it is true. And if a fact comes up that says that it is not true, then that is a lie. And not just a lie, but a conspiracy. So I'm in a business now of proving that the news is not a conspiracy, that the facts are not a conspiracy that the facts are not out to get you, that global warming is not out to get you, that scientists are not out to get you, that it's not a conspiracy against your values to say the earth is warming, that it's not a conspiracy against your values to say that a woman who has control of her reproductive rights is a more productive citizen who contributes more to society. It's not an assault on your values to say that. To say that an independent woman who's free to do as she wishes with her own body is actually a better contributor to society. That's not an assault on anyone's values, but we are at a point now where everything is an assault on values and everyone is picking and choosing what information they believe and only believing that which makes them feel good. And we have that trend that has existed for at least 40 years, but we've never had it accelerated and a pedal put to the metal by a president of the United States. We've never had to fight an administration who you can't believe the data that they put out who, when the spokesperson for the president gets up to the podium like this and speaks, you can't believe anything he says. <laughs> now, if he's Melissa McCarthy, I believe everything he says. Because <laughs> she's amazing. I believe what she says. But you can't believe them. You know, we used to have Kellyanne Conway on. Kellyanne Conway, Conway was a pollster. She used to deal in numbers and data. And now, she is somebody that we don't feel comfortable in a lot of the shows putting on TV because we have people who are willing to lie and lie with enthusiasm <laughs> and alacrity and not even flinch. It used to be that people would lie and they would you know, get a little something going. You know, now everyone's just lying breathlessly. <laughs> and the question is lying in service of what? That's the thing that's so disturbing for me is lying in service of what? In service of doing what? Why? get rid of the Affordable Care Act? Is it just because it's called Obamacare? A lot of people say yes. It's yes and no. What we need to start understanding is the news underneath the news. Underneath the news of wanting to get rid of Obamacare is a budget of trillions of dollars a year, two thirds of which is social health insurance, social insurance between Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid, veterans benefits, two thirds of the budget. Two thirds of your tax money goes to social insurance. And I don't mean food stamps, I mean social security, Medicare, Medicaid, VA, things that help people, that's where the money is. Only 15% of the budget is defense. And that's more than most countries, but it's still only 15% and nobody can cut it because there's a piece of those bombers, those F-35s in every state. They're coming for the money because that's where the money is. Getting rid of Obamacare would essentially create a $1 trillion kitty of money that could be given out in tax cuts for the very rich. And there's a certain thing in budget reconciliation that says that if you want to do a trillion dollar tax cut, you cannot increase the deficit by a trillion dollars. You need to find a trillion dollars somewhere else. They're gonna find it in Medicaid. They can find 800 billion of it in Medicaid. They're gonna find it in Medicare. They're gonna find it in little tiny items of the budget like the Corporation for Public Broadcasting that lets poor kids get Sesame Street. We're at a point now where only kids who can, whose families can afford HBO can get original Sesame Street. We're, we're losing some of the fundamental values. I've gone off my script, but we're losing, we're losing some of the fundamental values that made my parents come here. And so, yeah, I'm in the news business and it's my job to be fair and to be balanced, even though there's a, a group that has taken that fair and balanced thing and kind of twisted it into something else. It's my job to be fair, but it's not my job to be crazy, and it's not my job to give away all of our values. You know, my, my parents came here in 1960. My mother came here from British Guyana. Where my, my, my Guyanese posse was in the room earlier, yes. And my father came here from the Congo one of Paul Manafort's clients, <laughs> Mobutu Sese Seiko. And, and part of the reason that people come here is because of the pluralism and the freedom and the values of knowing no government official is going to check your phone. I recently came from Cuba with my husband. 
where people don't have the freedom to know that the government isn't going to go in their phone. And, and it's amazing to me to realize is that 60 years ago, nobody in Havana thought they would ever be oppressed. They thought they would always be the Havana that they were. If you look at Google pictures of Kabul, Afghanistan in the 1950s, it was a thriving metropolitan city like New Orleans. Nobody there, as they were going to the movies and walking around freely and women were going to school, thought they would ever lose that. There is no guarantee of freedom. There's no certainty of anything unless you fight for it. So now we'll get to the good news. Let me make sure I'm on time because we have, question, we have a Q&A part two. Some of the good news is that some of our institutions, our small L liberal institutions, are actually working. The courts are working. They beat back two Muslim travel bans and counting. Americans did beat back that first attempt to gut the health care that so many millions of Americans depend on, which had 17% approval rating. 59% of Americans, according to Gallup, say protecting the environment should be prioritized over energy production. And Americans overwhelmingly preferred the federal government emphasize green energy options like solar and wind over oil and gas and nuclear. The women's marches, as we talked about, not only were they huge, they were popular. They had a 60% approval rating as of February 1st, according to a Washington Post poll. That's versus a 27% approval rating for the Tea Party at the height of its protests in 2010. 60% approval. And as we learned from Reverend William Barber in North Carolina, who had a Moral Monday movement that remained popular from the beginning to today, that you can, you can maintain public support for a movement that is based on what is right and wrong, not what is right and left. Democrats, uh, for the Republicans in the room, may be worried about a little of this. Uh, Democrats are reporting be more likely than Republicans to increase their political involvement in the next year. Uh, and liberal Democrats are reporting the most likelihood of increasing their involvement at 49% versus 25% of all adults, 21% of Republicans. 40% of women in the poll say they plan to do more next year politically versus 27% of men. So women are leading the rebellion. Women are leading the revolution. Women are the reason that Donald Trump's approval rating is at 36% in Gallup. And at this point in his presidency, by the by, Barack Obama was at 62%. And before I take questions, I will say that my last reason for hope uh, and the last reason that you can still smile in the face of all that we're finding, all that we're seeing, all that we're dealing with, is that Michelle Obama is rocking her natural hair on vacation. And her shea butter game is so on point. She's so shiny. She gives me hope. Thank you very much. I've never seen the room like this. Um, we are going to take questions. There is a microphone right there. I do have one apology to my friends, the Delta Sorority. Um, they are a co-sponsor of this event, and we omitted them on the list. So would all my Deltas stand up? Thank you so much. Shirley Chisholm's sorority, by the way. <laughs> so we're going to ask people to line up at the microphone. And if there's a student on the line, let's let the student go first. But we'll take, we'll take the rest of us old people, too. And I'll just sit there and you okay. tell me when okay. Hello. Hi, my name is Len Gursky from East Brunswick. I don't know if we can hear you. Maybe mm -hmm. lean in. Okay, lean in. Can you hear me? There now? we go. My name is Len Gursky from East Brunswick. Uh, based on your involvement in the news business, <laughs> do you lend any credence to the rumor that I heard today that they're closer to coming up with a Trump Ryan Health Care Act by eliminating pre existing conditions from the uh, Trump? Yeah. Ryan. 
Sure. So what we're hearing now is that Donald Trump, um, you know, he's very influenced by whoever the last person is he talks to. So he went golfing <laughs> with Rand Paul and Rand Paul reiterated to him, uh, Rand Paul is a full repealer. He wants a full repeal of everything of Obamacare. Uh, and he reiterated to Trump that he needed to go back and try again. So the administration has met with the Freedom Caucus um, and they are laying out what they want. And what they want, to your point, is they want to get rid of um, everything except keeping kids on your insurance until they're 26. They, they don't mind keeping that. Um, they don't mind keeping pre-existing conditions as a part of the law because first of all, they can't repeal that. So Obamacare was written very skillfully. The regulations in it, the keeping your kids on, the um, pre-existing conditions is a regulation. You need 60 votes to overturn a regulation. Um, the only thing you can pass through reconciliation has to be budget related. Um, and so they can only get rid of the taxes that pay for Obamacare. They can get rid of the taxes on wealthy people, the taxes on Cadillac insurance plans. They can get rid of the subsidies that are helping people afford insurance, which would send the whole thing into a tailspin. They can get rid of all that, which they want to do. But what they want to do as a trick to get rid of pre-existing conditions on a sly is they would like to pass a rule that says, sure, if you, have a, you had cancer, you can get insurance, but the insurance company can charge you X times more. So what they want to do is essentially let sick people be charged more. Um, they want older people to be able to be charged more. They're really going after people over 50 and over 60. They want uh, to allow insurance companies to charge you five times more. Um, and their argument for that is why not? That's the market. Insurance companies can't make money if they have to charge everybody the same. So the freedom and the free market says they should be able to charge you more. If you were sick before, if your child is sick, they also want to bring back caps, lifetime caps. So let's say you have a child that has a, a, a prolonged illness or a congenital illness. When you reach that lifetime cap, let's say it's a million dollars, you're out of luck. Your further treatment for your child is on you. You can take out a loan, I guess, if you want, or as Mitt Romney said, borrow from your parents. <laughs> Those of us who are now orphans are, would be out of luck. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Hi. Go ahead. <clears throat> can you hear me? I'm a little short. <laughs> um, my name's Judy, and my, I have a two-part question. One is, do you believe in what you're seeing that eventually Trump will be impeached? And if so, are we even better off? Because Pence, to me, is just as scary. Yeah. Yeah. I went through the other day, and I did the line of succession. If, if Trump and they all... And eventually I got to Ben Carson, and I stopped. No offense, but he seems so tired. I don't know that he can handle it. It doesn't get better. You can go, like, 12, 13 deep. And you still with Tillerson, and there's a guy from, you know, Goldman Sachs over here. There's one that was trading on his health care bills over there. I mean, it's, it doesn't get better. Um, but whenever people bring up the impeachment thing to me, I always ask the question, who's going to impeach him? Who is going to do that? The House of Representatives has to bring impeachment charges. Which House member is going to do that? Paul Ryan? Paul Ryan's using Donald Trump to get his tax cuts through. Is it going to be Jason Chaffetz? Is it going to be Devin Nunez? Who I was calling Nunez. I was such a troll because I thought it was Nunez, but it's actually Nunez. I'm, I was wrong. So no, I don't think he's going to be impeached. I don't think that there is the political will on the Republican side to do anything to stop Donald Trump. I think they're going to let him do whatever he wants, buy whatever he wants, do whatever he wants in his businesses, break the emoluments clause wide open. His kids can buck rake on the presidency. The presidency is for sale. And I don't mind saying that even as somebody who's in the news business, this is what is happening. And the reason that I can say it is this is abnormal. This is not politics. This is not the way it works, but this is the way it's working now. We essentially are living in, inside, of a re, inside of Donald Trump's reality show and he can do whatever he wants. And nobody is going to stop him. Nobody, except you guys, except the people of this country. Nobody in Congress is going to stop him, period. Hi, Joy. My name is Dan Rabinovitz. I'm a, I live over in Somerset. I'm a retired high school math teacher. I have a statement and a, and a question. My statement is one thing, of course, you can't mention everything he's done wrong, but I am very concerned with the 20% cut at NIH that he has proposed, because about 12 years ago, my stepdaughter had to have some very specialized surgery, uh -huh. and NIH was the only place to go for it. Were it not for that, um, she probably wouldn't be here today, and I'm very, very concerned about that. I was also very concerned about, I remember last week, year, about a week before the election, the actress Susan Sarandon made the following <laughs> statement. I need a drink, hold on. Uh, 
You'll need one when you hear what I have to say. What she said was, I don't see any difference between Mrs. Clinton and Mr. Trump. Yeah. And I'm not going to mince words. That's the remark of a stupid person. <laughs> I'm not going to mince words. But the simple fact is, only 46% of his people voted for Trump. What can we do in the next two, three years uh -huh. to make sure that some of those people who simply stayed home on election day last year or went to the polls and wasted their vote on Dr. Jill Stein or Gary Johnson, what can we do to bring those people over? We have to. Thank mm. you. Thank you. Um, and Susan Sarandon is not sorry. She thinks it's working out brilliantly because look how energized people are. <laughs> look, how, look how the revolution is happening. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, exactly. So I, I would say I have an analogy that whenever I'm asked this question, I give the analogy of the burning house. And this is my analogy. If I see that your house is burning, is on fire, and I'm going to get you out, and you tell me your house is not on fire. And not only is your house not burning, but that when I say I smell smoke, I'm casting aspersions upon your cleaning ability. <laughs> that I, I think that the blackening of your wallpaper, I'm putting it down because I'm so hoity-toity that I don't think wallpaper should be black. That I think the temperature in your house is too hot because maybe I think I'm too good to be in a warm house. That maybe I just don't share your values and maybe you like your house to be that temperature and that that yellow flaming color is part of your decor and I'm just discriminating against you. And your house is in fact not on fire and I need to get the hell out. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get the hell out of your house, right? And I'm gonna take with me everyone in your house that wants to be saved, willingly. And if when I'm outside, it occurs to you that your house is burning down, I will very gladly try to go back and get you out too. All you can do is wait for people to realize their house is on fire. And believe me, they will realize their house is on fire. You can't convince people of what, I mean, the, the, the thing is, is that, and, I, and this is a big argument that Democrats have all the time. People in coal country voted for Donald Trump overwhelmingly and are now facing the loss of their black lung benefits. They know they're losing their benefits. You know what percentage of Republicans regret their Trump vote right now? Three. Most of them will still support Donald Trump, even as they lose their black lung benefits, even as their health care goes away, even as the wall causes eminent domain to seize their property, which is happening now. People are now afraid. Trump voters in Texas are freaking out because their property may be seized by eminent domain and their property may end up on the Mexico side of the wall because Trump didn't realize there's a thing called the Rio Grande. <laughs> <laughs> and that whole border ain't ours. Mexico kept some of that land, okay? We got Colorado and California and Nevada. which was Mexico, but they got, the, they got the Rio Grande. So you can't build a wall without building a wall through part of Mexico, and they have to approve that, which they're not gonna. So you have to eminent domain things. So people aren't going to change their minds. People voted for him for something other than their economic benefit, their economic situation. They voted for something else. Now, people don't like to speculate on what that something else is, but it has something to do with demographic panic and resentment and a sense that other people are taking things from me and they're taking and taking from me and I'm a hardworking person and they're not. And I'm going to vote for the guy who I think is the populist that's going to bring me back, bring back the industries that I care about, bring back the jobs that are my kind of job, bring back people like me, make us important again, get those immigrants out. I mean, I can't tell you how many people um, have said in these articles that say uh, they, they do are worried about Trump, or they say, oh, I just wanted the wall. I just wanted the immigrants deported. I didn't want to lose my health care. Well, <laughs> I don't know what you do with a person. I don't know what, what are you going to say to that person to convince them that they don't want the wall, that they were wrong to want to deport people, that they're wrong to want to see a Muslim's ban. That's what they wanted. And they got it. And for a lot of people, that's all they wanted. And now that the election is over, they're satisfied. They're no longer thinking in terms of Donald Trump. They're thinking, I got what I wanted, and now these other problems are separate from him. Or they're the fault of Democrats. Or they're the fault of Obama somehow. Or, or you know, it's something else. So I don't believe you can drag people out of a burning house. I just don't. That's just me. I'm, some people disagree. Yes.
Hi, Joy. But what you can do, sorry, did you say one thing quickly for the, for the what can we do thing? The only thing that changes countries is legislatures. And if Democrats want to stop Donald Trump, you need to put a, a house in there that will curb him, mm -hmm. right? You, you need to put, get, Obama always said, give me a house and Senate. If you want a better president, get a better Congress. So if you don't like what you're seeing with the president, get a better Congress, and only voters can do that. So, go on. Hi, Joy. My name is Lori, and I'm from Somerset. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you so much because you were, if not one of the first, the first journalist who I saw on television actually confront and call BS to those <laughs> Trump surrogates that came in and lied their butts off. And you were one of the first people to actually call them on their BS. So I appreciate Thank that, you. and I think everybody here probably <laughs> does too. Thank you. The, the concern that I have is that I, I don't know where we go from here in terms of the level of discourse. Trump has so demeaned the process and really degraded the level of discourse what happens in four years when it's yeah. time to do this stuff all over again? Can we get it back to where it was, where people were actually talking about issues and not lying consistently about everything, truth being a lie and lie being truth? And, yep. and the electorate not only tolerating it, but accepting it and actually putting it forth as a continuing truth. Mm -hmm. Where does it go from here? Where do you see that in the next four years? Well, I, I will just say that while Trump is unusual, the idea of a president having outre views or offensive views is not. The first however many presidents owned slaves, and nobody thought that was odd. Other than John Quincy Adams, they, they were, I mean, John Adams, I believe they were all slave owners. And nobody found it ironic when they recently did the rankings and put Barack Obama at 12. One of the reasons he's at 12 is they ranked him on moral authority below people like Woodrow Wilson, who was a noxious, vicious racist who put the Klan in the White House in the form of birth of a nation, right? Um, we've had presidents like uh, Andrew Jackson, one of the founders of the Democratic Party, who was a slave-owning, vicious, Native American slaughtering, genocidal racist. We've had Richard Nixon, who was a crook. We've had, you know, Harry Truman, who a lot of people thought was a, kind of a dunderhead, right? We've had, we've had, we've had some pretty rough goes with presidents. They haven't all been sterling men of great character. Um, one could argue that the ones who were sterling men of great character were the minority, were the exception, right? There were a few real standouts, great men, but even the great ones almost all cheated on their wives. FDR had his nurse living, his nurse slash girlfriend living in the house. She came to the funeral. Um, the Kennedys, who were some of the most caring, that family has given everything to this country. They've sacrificed their children to the country, but that wasn't a perfect marriage. His behavior wasn't perfection, right? I mean, no, none of these presidents are perfect. Bill Clinton obviously had his foibles <laughs> when it came to women and things, but he was in a lot of ways a great president. There are very few presidents who stand out for exemplary moral character. There's one who had no choice, and that's Barack Obama. Right? So, so what happens after you have a, an awful president, after Woodrow Wilson was president, and to me one of the worst of the worst, and it, it just bothers me when he gets put in the top 10, because he was just an awful man. But what happens after that is that you have an opportunity for the next president to maybe do some good. There are presidents who've been able to restore that feeling. I think of the president as sort of the avatar for the nation, right? So even if they aren't perfect, Teddy Roosevelt gives us that feeling that we have that daring do. FDR is like the national father that restores our sense of hope and saves us from fear and gives us freedom from want and freedom from fear and wins World War II. We have Truman who, despite his uh, many flaws, signed that executive order to integrate the army they integrate the armed forces, which took 15 years to actually go through. You have LBJ, who grew up a, a segregationist, but who was the one Southerner to not sign the Southern Manifesto after Brown v. Board, and who steps up after Kennedy is assassinated and passes Kennedy's Civil Rights Bill. And even though he sort of destroyed his presidency with Vietnam, he still had greatness in, his, in him. 
right? I mean, a, a, lot, a lot of these presidents can be restorative, and I think that we're in for a restoration. We're a people who restore ourselves. That's one of the things that makes America great. So I think, you know, we can survive bad presidents. Um, George W. Bush being president got us Barack Obama. <laughs> <laughs> So I think it'll be okay. And, and I'll say this one quick thing before I move on. Um, the last like, little um, uh, party, they do like a party at the White House for the media at the end. Uh, I think reluctantly. I don't think they really want to do it. Um, but the Obamas are always so sweet. They're always so kind, right? You brought, I brought my godmother who was in her 80s and they were very sweet to her. I brought my kids to it. And the last one, I brought my daughter. Um, and this was the most sort of poignant one because obviously it was the last one. Um, and I wanted my daughter to have the opportunity to meet particularly Michelle. Um, and as we're leaving, you know, I don't think he would mind me saying that the president, you know, said to me, because I was clearly like, I, we are, we are, we are doomed. <laughs> we're doomed. And he said, no, no, we're going to be okay. Because he truly believes in the resiliency of the institutions of this country. He really does. It's not, he's not faking that. He really does. So I think if he can believe it and be chilling on vacation thinking everything's okay, <laughs> it's going to be okay. Yes. Hi, my name is Alex Anderson. I'm a student here at Rutgers. I was Yay. <laughs> I was wondering, as a journalist, what lessons did you learn from the election and how are you changing your coverage moving forward? Very good question. Excellent question. The, what I, one of the things I learned um, is, how, is how much data can trick you in this business. I'm a, I'm a data nerd. I love the data. And we all lived on the 538 refreshes and the upshot. The data was wrong, but it was wrong in a very specific way. Um, it was wrong because it underestimated the enthusiasm of the Trump voter versus the lack of enthusiasm of the Democratic voter, even if they were reporting to you that they were going to vote the way they were going to vote. Um, and it underestimated the extent to which those Rust Belt states were falling off of a cliff, as Michael Moore was telling us anecdotally during the campaign. Um, and they didn't fall far off a cliff. I mean, Hillary Clinton lost by 77,000 votes across Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. 77,000, 10,800 in Michigan, not a lot. But that there was enough of a drop off there that we missed. So I think one of the things the election taught me is that you really do need to look way past the data and trust the anecdotal that you're hearing, the lack of enthusiasm when we went to Ohio and talked to Democratic steel workers who just were not feeling Hillary Clinton and were open to Donald Trump and who, but despite being union guys, really were not into her. Young voters, who, including my kids and their, at their age, not them themselves, but their friends who were just like, Hillary Clinton is evil. And, and you know, the anecdotals were telling us what was going to happen and a lot of us did not believe it because the data was telling us something else. And so you cannot just trust the data. You really have to get out of the data and get out into the country. And that's the biggest takeaway. Yep. Hi. Good evening, Joe. My name is Bill Davis. Hello. How are you? Good. It's an honor and privilege to, for you to be here. And I have um, a comment and a question. And so following up on the question that you just raised about the data, one of the things to me that hasn't really been talked about a lot is when the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act. I don't know that Donald Trump wins if the Voting Rights Act is in place because between the voter suppression and all the other things that took place, then it seems to me that yes, there is a divide, but I think that Hillary would have won the election had the Voting Rights Act been in place. And my question is whether or not we're going to get some more joy in the evening. <laughs> when I'm filling well, in. <laughs> well, let, 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 let me expand a little bit. <laughs> so if you look at all the major networks at nighttime, prime time, there's no people of color hosting anything. And Don so, Lemon. Okay, excuse me, Don Lemon, one. And Lester on broadcast. Who's the number one broadcast show, by the way? Yeah, number one evening news show. But, uh, but I'm hoping mm -hmm. that we're going to see some more diversity on the airways. Yeah. Now, I don't know if there's any effort, any strategies that could be talked about as far as how to make that happen. Yeah. Th thank you for both of those uh, questions. Wait, so your first question was? About the Voting Rights Act. About Voting Rights Act. Okay, so uh, I agree with you on the Voting Rights Act. One of the most underreported stories of this year was the giant, enormous purge of voters off the voter rolls that was led by a guy named Chris Kovach, who used to be the Kansas Attorney General. Uh, but even in his role as Kansas Attorney General, he helped write SB 1070, which was called the Papers, Please Law in Arizona. He is an anti-immigration crusader. Um, with some very interesting racial views about the kinds of immigrants he thinks are desirable. And there are people inside the administration who share those views. Um, he created a thing called cross-check that was used by dozens of Republican attorneys general 
uh, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, secretaries of state to purge their voting rolls. And the way they did it was a very simple yet very novel way. If your name is Jorge Gonzalez and my name is Jorge Gonzalez, we are considered the same voter. We're a double voter. We're both off. Um, mm -hmm. If your name is John Smith and my name is John Smith, you're probably okay. Yeah. That is how that was done. 300,000 people in Wisconsin were not able to get IDs despite having one of the strictest, most draconian voter ID laws in the country. Uh, there was a, an attempt to try to sue to get them. The nation did the story. Ari Berman did the story almost every week. Nobody really paid attention to it. We did it as much as we could on our show. But um, 300,000 people languished without being able to get the ID. They were given every excuse in the book. Sorry, you have to come back in six weeks. The election's going to be over by then. Those 300,000 people in a state that Trump won by what, like 40,000 votes? Yeah. Um, North Carolina, where my friend Reverend Dr. William Barber fought the, the, the law that was called the kitchen sink law. They went after every form of voting and they did it in a very, um, very open and brazen way. They did a study uh, in the North Carolina Republican-led legislature and they said, what kind of voting do uh, systems and um, methods do black people use? And what kind of voting methods and systems do white people use? And then when they got it, that, the answer back, they got rid of all the ones that black people use. Early voting, they cut that back. Um, same day voter registration, they got rid of that. Uh, automatic registration at 17, they got rid of that. Everything black people used, they literally did it so brazenly that the court said that it was textbook and that it was so blatant and brazen, even the lower court in the South had to throw it out. And even after that, they still tried tricks. They closed the only voting locations for miles and miles and made people travel on buses for miles and miles in rural counties. They moved voting places at the last minute. They tried everything in the book, and when it was all over, the Republican Party of North Carolina rejoiced that they reduced black turnout. And they did it in a memo. They put it in writing. They were that open and brazen about rejoicing in reducing black voting. Barack Obama won North Carolina by 14,000 votes in 2008. He only lost it by 90,000 votes. Hillary Clinton lost it by a razor thin margin. So I think you could make an argument that no voter suppression, no Trump. And one of the big misses in this election was the Democratic Party did this about voter suppression. Right. They did nothing. Right. Right. They didn't file a lawsuit. I mean, listen, say what you want about Eric Holder. Eric Holder sued everybody. He was like, I'm suing Texas. There's not even a chance a Democrat will ever win in Texas. He sued Texas. He sued Pennsylvania. He sued everybody and their mama. And that is what you have to do. You have to be aggressive because voter suppression is aggressive. And if you think it's over, think again. It's coming even harder because 2020 is a census year. Yes. And to the earlier person's question about what you can do, one of the things you can do is stop worrying so much about the president and start thinking not even about the Congress, but the state legislatures. We are ignoring yes. the most important yes. people. Yes. The president will never affect your life personally. Very rarely will you have a chance to interact with him personally. It's not like the president is directly impacting your life. If he passes no laws, your state legislature is everything. They draw the districts. And we, Demo you know, Americans have forgotten about the local politics. We have let local politics wane. A lot of us don't even know who our local elected officials are. It's, it's insane. You know, if you don't know your school board people and you don't know your, your state house and state senate members, they are the people who change your life. The judges are the ones who put your kid in prison or give him a, a break. And people don't even know who they are. So the one thing that I'm a vote monger and I'm literally like a fanatic about it. I shouldn't start because I'll never stop. You, you have to vote. You have to vote in every election. You have to vote in locals. You have to know who you're voting for and find out who they are. And, and very quickly before I move on, don't just vote for somebody because they're a Democrat. You guys know who Sheriff D David Clark is? The, the, the angry sheriff that hates Black Lives Matter? He's a Democrat. <laughs> He runs and wins as a Democrat. Yes, he is a Democrat. Because the only way you can become elected in Milwaukee County is to be a Democrat. So he is a Democrat. He runs as a Democrat. In Democratic primaries, the NRA encourages Republicans in that open primary to cross over and vote for him in the primary. And then all the black people and all the Democrats vote for him in the general because he's a Democrat. The, the district attorneys in the Michael Brown case, Democrat. In the Laquan McDonald case, Democrat, elected with Barack Obama, Hispanic woman, Democrat. These people are Democrats. The Corey Jones case, the guy who was rolled up on by a van, an unmarked van, and shot the minute the policeman jumped out of the car in Palm Beach County. Democrat. Democrats control these big city prosecutor's offices, because that's the only way you can get elected. And people are electing them without even thinking about it. 
So one of the things that I really hope changes out of this election, particularly with women really stepping forward and really being active, is that you'll have better voter education and people will actually think about the primaries and think about the local, local, local. It's all about local. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Oh. Hello. Hi. A student. Okay. Hi, my name is Nia. I'm almost 16 years old and I'm in high school. Oh, wow. And I watch your show really often. Oh, so. yay. <laughs> So my question is, because I talk to a lot of my friends in school, and we're all young, and we want to support the movement, but we're not really sure how we can because of our age. So um, my question is, what do you suggest we do, being that we're kind of young and we can't really do that much? Yeah. No, you can. See, what a lot of people don't realize is that the biggest influence on people my age are our kids. Our teenage children have more influence over us than anybody else. Young people doing activism moves their parents. It, it causes their parents to rethink positions. You know, Barack Obama said it about his views on gay marriage. It was his kids that changed his mind. And so I think young people can be in the movement, marching and in the movement as much as anyone else. And also you guys can be lobbying the adults to get our heads screwed on straight. Because it's your country. There are more of you than us. You know, the, the young generation, the, the um, not Gen X, but the next one, the millennials, there are actually no, numerically more millennials than boomers now. Because boomers are dying off and millennials are coming up, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry, boomers, but we're, I'm almost a boomer. I'm a Gen X. So there are more of you. It's your country. I'm old now. I say crazy things. I don't know if I'm tall. I'm sorry. Yes. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yep. OK. <laughs> Hi, I'm Akia Thorpe. I'm a journalism student here graduating in May. Great. And, um, <laughs> and so going out, I was wondering if you know about any programs that you've been a part of or that anyone else, any other famous journalist has been a part of um, that are good for young African-American journalists like myself oh. going onto the field. That's a great question. Um, I, I was a member of the South Florida Journalist, Black Journalist Association, which is the local version of NABJ. It was very helpful. Um, my current boss, Yvette Miley, who is uh, an African-American woman executive, who's my boss, uh, vice, uh, executive vice president at MSNBC, that's how I met her. That's how I connected with her. So the NABJ chapters are actually really good, and they're very good for networking and meeting people. So I would join those kinds of organizations. Um, we have the ladies of Delta Sigma Theta here, Sororities are incredible and great networking organizations. Any of the sororities, they're all really, uh, really terrific. The sisterhood is very powerful, and they really support each other. Um, and a lot of them have junior organizations, right? That you can get involved in, like gems and other uh, you, you organizations. Even before you get into, you can see I'm a wannabe, right? I know I'm like blatant. I'm like blatant. Um, but you can get involved in those things. And I would recommend doing it. When I was your age, I was like, I don't want to join things, you know? And when I was in high school, it's like, I don't want to do like high school join things, but you really should. Um, you should do it in high school because you start to develop your network. Your network is how you get jobs. It's not who you know, it's who knows you. That's my favorite saying. It's who will call you back. It's who knows your name. It's who remembers you. That's how you get ahead. So in the journalism side, and then if you're um, interested in getting in journalism, definitely do um, internships, things like the NBC Page program, stuff like that. Join all that stuff. It's important. Good luck. Now I'm sweating. She interned with Ken Burns last summer, so she's on. Hello. <laughs> Hi, I'm Khadija White. Um, I'm a Thank professor you. of journalism oh here. I needed a church fan so badly. Yay. Oh my God. Thank you. God bless you. <laughs> um, First, I just wanted to say with Gwen Ifill passing, I see you taking up her mantle. Oh, and God, um, I just want to say thank you for being kind of a harbinger of truth with Chuck Todd and Tom Brokaw, who believe in the Moynihan Report, and Megan Kelly being your new colleague. So I, <laughs> I just want to say Shame. thank you. Uh, and, um, and I hope you keep on. We cheer up for you on Sunday mornings. Um, I, I want to say, I want to ask uh, two quick questions. Do you think that Democrats have learned anything from this election? And uh, two, with uh, women in being particularly affected by this administration and minorities, I'm wondering what you think the role of women in uh, minority journalists are yeah. right now, and are they able to even kind of intervene in what's happening? Um, thank you. Um, so as for whether the Democrats learned anything, I think they did. One of the things that they learned that you can see them implementing is to really listen to their base 
to li you know, and Democrats haven't been good about listening to the base. Democrats have tended to kind of spurn, particularly the liberal part of their base. But they're really letting the grassroots lead them now. They're not leading on it. Um, people like Nancy Pelosi are very smart about it. Maxine Waters, they're they're letting the grassroots lead, and they're following, which is smart. Um, I think we all learned. Um, I have a saying that. Uh, I, and I, I'm sorry, I bring a lot, I, I'm, saying I always, I'm always saying I have a saying, but I do have all these sayings, unfortunately. Um, and one of them is that if you think about the country's history from the Civil War to 19, oof, to like 1920, it took 50 additional years after this country, which was sort of founded on a hatred and contempt for black people, right? But it took 50 extra years for this country to give their to give white women the right to vote after black men, so you know the sort of saying that I kind of came to after this election is that in a lot of ways America hates black people, but in a lot of ways they hate their wives more. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so the Democrats I think have figured that out, and that women are in a uniquely disadvantaged position, even with other women, even with other women voters. 52% of white women voters voted for Trump. So, <laughs> so I, think, well, I think the Democratic Party has learned that, and now what they're trying to do is center women, and particularly women of color, and they're really realizing they have to do that. And then in order to win, they need to figure out what is the alchemy that they need to get women to go from being the, the majority majority to being a, a functioning governing majority. They're only like 22% of the Senate, I think, are women. It's very, it's very odd that women aren't doing better, especially winning statewide races. So I think they learned that. Mm -hmm. All right. Hello. Hi, Joy. Hello. How are you? Good, how are you? I'm good. <laughs> uh, my name's Christian Chang. I'm from West Hampton, New Jersey. I just wanted to say that on the weekends I get up early in the morning to watch you. Thank you. That's very difficult being a college student. <laughs> I'm a political sci science student here, but I want to have a career in law someday. Um, I wanted to ask about a New York Times report that came out just four days ago about the White House ending bu the American Bar Association's role in vetting judges. Hmm. Um, Considering that I'm a prospective law student, the courts are very important to me naturally. Yep. Um, and the courts, as you said, are one of our state institutions that are, by the grace of God, still working. So my question is, how can we as voters, even though the courts are insulated, what can we really do to fight back on that? Mm -hmm. And what is we as lawyers, and especially young lawyers and law students, do to make sure that this institution stays working? Good question. Um, so you know that uh, there's been a, 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 di a contempt for the Bar Association on the right for a very long time. It's seen as leaning to the left. Um, it gave Clarence Thomas quite a poor rating, which kicked off a lot of the modern dislike for it, because they felt that Clarence Thomas was treated poorly by being given a pretty low rating. Um, a, lot, a lot of people believe he earned the low rating. Um, is it weird to anybody else that he doesn't talk? It, I, mean, I don't want to start. It's camera's wrong. So, well, after Scalia died, yeah. So there is there has been a lot. There's been a big push on the right to really not use them and. Trump, in his picking of Gorsuch, really just used the Heritage Foundation and conservative think tanks. And so I think there's a big push from some on the right to just do that and not use um, that, in, you know, the bar social. So I think that's a problem. I think we're already heading. Look, the, I think the idea that the Supreme Court is an apolitical institution is an idea nobody believes anymore anyway. It's just another arm of our partisan politics already. So I think taking the veneer and pretending that these are, you know, nine jurists with no opinions and no biases, I think was ridiculous anyway, and it's long past gone. And again, it comes right back to the same thing. The only thing you can do about that is give your, if you prefer one party or the other, give that party the power to pick the justices. And it comes right back to the same thing again, voting. Because the Senate pick, the Senate decides who gets on and who doesn't get on. And you know, Democrats have done a very poor job of really linking 
voting to the courts and to these outcomes in the Supreme Court. The destruction of the Voting Rights Act was the greatest tragedy. Um, Citizens United was pretty bad too, but the, the destruction of the Voting Rights Act was a, a tragedy that could have decades long implications um, for people of color in particular and for young people who are trying to come up because they're also targeted by these things. So I think what one thing that lawyers, young lawyers can do and that attorneys are doing all over the country is assisting in these efforts to protect voters and to protect voting rights. There have been some heroic efforts by people like Cheryl and Eiffel and others who are really fighting for civil liberties for migrants who are fighting these Muslim bans and fighting to get people out of detention who are dreamers. And I think attorneys right now are going to be kind of the, they're going to be the heroes of this movement in the end because, you know, the only way, the only only functioning part of our three-part government system right now is the courts. The rest of it is not functioning. The, 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 con the, con the congressional part is not functioning. The administrative part is not functioning. So we need lawyers. So get your degree quick. <laughs> <laughs> two more. Okay, we have time for two more questions. Uh, I'll try and be quick then. Or, how many people are in line? Four? Why don't you all ask your questions in order and I'll try to remember them all. <laughs> there we go, so go. So, yeah. uh, hi, I'm Lori Lindsay. I am a double major in journalism and landscape architecture. And um, in May, six days before my 51st birthday, wow. I will be graduating with honors. You look like a teenager. Oh my God. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> you can come home with me. You look young. <laughs> And I will uh, also be very, very proud to shake Dean Litt's hand as I'm also a Douglas woman. How wonderful. <laughs> so my question is, um, with everything uh, that we're seeing right now, and we've seen it across the globe before, how afraid are you with everything that you're seeing that we've seen before? How afraid are you um, that we, too, are going to experience a brain drain where the people best qualified to get us out of this situation simply won't be here? Huh. OK, that's a good question. All right, thank you. We're going to let everyone ask, and then I'll, I'm, running, I'm running them down. OK. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm Gabrielle Woods. I'm a huge fan of your show. <laughs> Watch it all the time with my mom, Not well, unless actually super cool, whatever you want to call it. Um, Thank you. My question, um, I read that you concentrated in film while you were in college, and you know, as someone who's really interested in that, I was wondering what role you think the entertainment media plays in kind of shaping our political climate as Very a country. Very good question. OK, I'll re-ask the questions. Very good. Thank you. Okay. OK, so we'll get the next person. Uh, good evening, Ms. Reed. Hello. Um, I, too, am a big fan of your show, and so is my father. Like, I watch it with him all the time. Thank you. Uh, I'm a junior here at Rutgers University, political science major. I also hope to, career, hope to pursue a career in law one day. Excellent. I'm also a, chill, a child of immigrants. My parents are from Nigeria. So, Excellent. Yeah. Um, the question I have for you is, do you think that this election would have turned out differently if, let's say, someone like Senator Cory Booker or someone like Joe Biden would have ran? Someone with a better track record than Hillary Clinton. Like I've always been thinking about that lady. Do yeah. you think that a Democrat would have been the White House if one of those two men yeah. ran? And also, second question, really quick. Do you think that after Trump's administration, that um, we will see like a um, an era of the Democratic Party dominating American politics for like maybe 15, 20 years, just like it was in like, <laughs> the, you know, the 20th century, like, you know, those trends. Do you think we might see that? Those are my questions. Thanks. Okay. All right. Okay. Hello. Hi, Joy. Hey. Uh, my name is Jonathan Pippa, and I'm a sophomore here at Rutgers. Cool. Excellent. And uh, my question is, given the current extremely divided political climate, do you think that'll change anytime soon and, and you know, get better, or do you think or do you foresee it um, getting worse, especially with the uh, lack of bipartisan a action in Congress? Right. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much. Those are four good questions. I'm going to try to answer them quickly. Very good. Excellent. Give them all a hand. All right. So on the first question, which is how afraid um, are you of the brain drain, I am very afraid of it. I'm very concerned about it. One of the things that's happening, I think I mentioned a little earlier, is this immigration, this attempt to limit immigration is chilling travel to the United States. 
And that has direct implications for our country, for our universities, um, which have lots of international students who are now afraid to either come here at all or to go home um, for fear they won't be able to come back. Um, a lot of our industries, Silicon Valley, the tech industry, are very reliant on immigrants. Um, and the medical field, which is the most reliant of anything else. Um, and the, the irony is the place that relies the most on foreign-born doctors is Red America. Um, there are rural counties in this country that have one doctor, and in a lot of cases, that doctor is not an American. And they are sealing their own doom with this desire to deport and to lock out people uh, from other countries because whether it's doctors or nurses, we have a huge shortage because our young people like yourselves, yes, they're going into law, they're going on Wall Street, they're not going into medicine at the same numbers as they used to. So we have a problem. And so I am concerned about a brain drain of people just not wanting to come here anymore. And that's a problem. Um, the role of the, of the role of the entertainment media, I think, is very important. I think one of the, the residual effects of Trump is that the artist community has really stepped forward. They feel a responsibility to represent um, our cultural values, and I think they're doing a really good job of it for the most part. You have a few little off, off people who will say some weird things sometimes, but they get really corrected very quickly. Um, looking at you, little Wayne. Um, <laughs> Snoop is like the enforcer, y'all. Snoop Dogg is like the enforcer. He and T.I. are like nobody says anything in hip hop that's wrong in Q-Tip. So there are a lot of artists that are really stepping forward and actually in a real way. There are people like Talib Kweli who are actually activists and artists. I mean activists as well as artists. But even in the TV media, one of the things that actually has been heartening has been there's been a real big push um, to empower women uh, on the screen, and it's been much more so in the small screen than in the big screen. Uh, on TV, you have a lot more strong women and women of color characters, um, and that seems like a small thing, but growing up, if you didn't see a lot of superheroes that looked like you, you know, literally in the news business, it was really just Gwen Ifill and, you know, a handful of black women on TV, but in the entertainment me uh, media, it was even less. Um, you know, it, it's it's very important. Those kinds of things can change things. Is there? You know, he's a bad guy now, but at the time, the Cosby Show really changed America. Um, it gave black people an image of themselves as that was a possibility that had never been on TV before, and sort of an Ozzy and Harriet version of ourselves that white people could actually see us as full family unit human beings. And so, I think the entertainment media is super important, and I think they're actually doing quite a good job. Um, and I pray for Susan Sarandon. Yeah, I'll just pray for her. <laughs> <laughs> She's going to see the light. Would the election have been different if Cory Booker or Biden had, had won, had run? I would argue with Booker, no, because I think part of the rejection was a rejection of all the change. And Barack Obama being the change, Trump is the backlash. So you have to think, who could have beaten back that backlash? Biden, maybe, because he's a white man, just to be frank would have had a better chance than Cory Booker, for sure. And that's a sad commentary on America, that unlike uh, Liberia and Pakistan and Israel and England and Germany and on and on and on, we can't seem to elect a woman. We have a real problem that we can't seem to elect a woman. So I'm not happy that I think Biden would have, would have at least had a chance. But there's also a chance that nobody could have won, that nobody could have stopped this because, number one, the Russia factor is an X factor, that we don't know what role it played. Um, the promulgation of fake news stories that convinced people that, for instance, Hillary Clinton killed 40 people. I mean, there are liberals who believe that, right? So, I mean, that, was, that would have still been there maybe. I don't know. Would the Russians have gone after the election the same way if it was Biden and not Hillary? I don't know. So there's so many X factors, you can never go back and refight an election. All you can do is fight the next one. Um, and I think you sh we should, uh, dem the country shouldn't even be thinking about 2020 yet. Y'all need to be thinking about 2017 and 2018 because <laughs> you've got a, a gubernatorial election in this state. And by the way, you know, Democrats are going to rediscover federalism. The states can fight the federal government and the states are going to have to fight. States' rights had a bad meaning in the past, but right now the states are going to have to defend their own citizens, defend their own immigrants, defend their sanctuary cities, defend their people of color. Um, you now have an attorney general that is is asking for a review of all the policing findings under the Obama administration. They're going to roll back police reform. It's going to become dangerous. I mean, these Black Lives Matter young people, I always tell them, you know, y'all want to be John Lewis, but John Lewis had RFK. You got Jefferson Sessions. <laughs> this is a different world, and it's going to become dangerous to be out there marching. So it is a very dangerous world, and you're going to have to rely on mayors and governors and state legislatures and city councils to protect and defend you. Um, and the last question is, given the divide, do I think it will change? Sadly, my answer to that is no. 
because as a country, what we're doing is we're moving we, were, we, all, we sort of have been two countries for a very long time, but in the very beginning, the northern country needed the southern country because it supplied the, the product that the northern country was selling on the world market. And so Lincoln couldn't let go of the South. He couldn't let the Confederacy go because it was, it, was, it was the engine of the American economy. It made the United States a first world economy because of the engine of cotton and agriculture. Now. That isn't the case anymore. We are two countries that uh, are separate in values, are separate in beliefs, are separate even in our conception of what the facts of basic facts are, and which are increasingly looking at each other with suspicion and hatred. Um, and people are not only thinking that, they're acting on it. People are moving to communities where only people ideologically like them live. People are increasingly isolating themselves in a social media bubble where, with only people who agree with them. We have very little commonality. We don't watch the same shows. We don't like the same celebrities anymore. We don't watch the same news. It's very difficult to see how this reverses itself, short of having some grand unifying figure who could be president of the United States. I can't think of who that is at the moment. Um, but maybe that person will come along. Maybe the outcome of all this will be that in 2020, some incredibly unifying, um, heroic figure will be president of the United States and will have 70% approval ratings and the love of the country, and she will be a badass. We don't know who she is. <laughs> So I think you can I think you can feel the love in this room and that what this comes from is that you are somebody who every week is there to ask the hard questions to look at issues that aren't always getting covered the way they should be and you can see that we are grateful to have you here today but that we are grateful to have you on the air every week and we need you so hang in there. Thank you.